This is a green tape. 1983 NFO National Convention in Denver, Colorado. What we're, what we're going to do to give you an idea how we're going to run these meetings, because we are decentralized in the biggest part of the areas, we're going to spend the home office staff, uh, myself, Mark, Shelley, and Dave, are going to spend probably about 30 minutes or 40 minutes talking about different things connected with the program that we talked about upstairs yesterday. And then what we're going to do is break into regional meetings to get set up, have your people talk about uh, with, your, with your area supervisors, with your staff that's in those areas, talk about how you're going to get set up in designated counties. If you don't have county structure put together, how you're going to set up to coordinate the effort after we get back home after the convention on this, on this corn and bean and wheat block thing that we're talking about. But we're going to have to have, <clears throat> we're going to have to be done or out of those regional meetings, you'll have to break at 10 o'clock. They're going to give everybody 30 minutes to move from one meeting to the other one. So somebody, uh, the guys who are conducting those regional meetings, our area meetings, Keep your clocks checked so by 10 o'clock we can break. That's not going to give us very much time, <clears throat> but uh, anyhow, that's how we're going to do it. I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to go back just for about 10 minutes here and go over some of the things we talked about yesterday and why we proposed to the convention body yesterday that we do what we're doing in, in corn, beans, and wheat. And I'll go back over some figures here, and there's brochures available <clears throat> that you can have that's got, that are set up on corn and beans specifically. And there is a series of about six or eight or ten questions that we run into out in the field when we were field testing this thing, that, the ten questions that were most often asked. And we put them in here, and I think when you go down the road to make contacts, if you just take one of these with you, carry a, a brochure with you or two, and go right and follow that set plan that's in these brochures. It goes through and tells you why, like a $10 bean block, why should I participate? How many bushels do we need to achieve? How do I participate in it? What's it gonna cost me? If I sign up, can I get out of the block? All those type of questions are answered in this thing. And it's, it's gonna be a real good tool that we can use down the road that you, ha you don't have to have a canned presentation. You go in and start and work right through that brochure and go right from there. But let me go back and talk about the figures of where we're at and why we are suggesting and why we suggested that we do what we do. Now, it's a little bit different than what we've been doing in the grain department in the past as far as this type of a block is concerned. And we understand right up front that it is probably one of the most risky things that we have done for a while. But we sincerely feel that the situation that we've got in corn, especially corn and soybeans, and with the situation that's developing in wheat, if we wind up with another bumper crop in wheat, we're going to have that hanging over our heads. And we could wind up in a position to where, especially on wheat, that you're going to have the government owning two or three years of crop by loan sitting out here in bins, just like happened back in the 60s and back in the 50s. And they're going to use that to depress those prices. And that's why we're doing what we're suggesting to do here today. It's not a deviation or it's not the direction that we're going to go. But on a short run basis, we want to stick with and work towards and keep working on program marketing. But when we're sitting at the prices where they are now, program marketing is not being successful. We've got to do something to raise that general price level to get ourselves in a position to where we can lock in for next fall on the crops that are coming off then and also during the summer. As far as USDA figures are concerned on corn, and we went over these yesterday, but I'll go over them again this morning, so I know some of you probably didn't get them written down. The 1982-1983 crop carryover on corn was 3.14 billion bushel. That is actual ending carryover stocks that they had at the end of 1982-1983 fiscal year, or crop year. The estimated for this year, for 1983-1984, is only going to be 
510 million bushel, which is about an 80 percent drop. Those are probably the lowest stocks, and we talked yesterday afternoon out in the halls, I was talking to people, and I don't know how long it's been that the, crops, that the stocks have, have been as low as they are estimating right now. If, in fact, those figures are right on corn alone, you're going to have about a 15-day supply of corn left by the time we go back in the field to start picking the crop that we're going to put in the ground this spring. And that puts us in a very, very good situation to put psychological effect, put a psychological effect on that market and push that cash market up. If we can move, and wheat and corn are directly related to each other, if we can get corn to move, and that is the most critical one as far as the sharpness is concerned, if we can get corn to start to move, we feel that wheat is going to start coming up with it and with the efforts that's going to be going on in the wheat countries, in the wheat country as far as contracting and on this same type of program, that we can start making that thing move up. Now, the important thing that we got to do as far as telephone, the important thing that we got to do once we get this thing started, and you'll do that in your regions, and we'll not get involved in that operation. That's up to your managers and to, and to the staff that are in those areas. But once you get that thing started, you start holding meetings, you start getting people out, and you get these people talking four and a half corn at the Gulf and $10 beans and 475 wheat or whatever. You're going to have to keep working on that until you get it to the point to where it is the topic of, a co of, of conversation in a coffee shop, and it will come to that because the people who we have contacted catch on very fast what we're doing. They understand what we're trying to do, and they will get involved in it. But you're going to have to work with media people in your areas, in each one of your areas. You're going to have to keep it in front of the press. And when we start getting, after we get started and at the home office and we start seeing that market go up, there will be releases come out to each one of the areas so you know where we're at. And if that market starts to move, you're going to get that much more people involved in the thing to keep pushing it up. Like I said yesterday, on corn, we don't have to move it all, all, that, very, all that much. Beans is probably around $1.70. But where the stocks are at, the psychology that's being used by the trade to push it down, we have got no choice but to start something on this side to start pushing that thing back up, pushing the market back up, the cash market. On beans, as far as carryover is concerned, 1982-1983, carryover, according to USDA, was 387 million bushel. And 1983-1984 estimated carryover on beans will be 140 million bushel, or about 60 percent less. And that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 days supply left when we go out in the country to start cutting this next fall. On wheat, all wheats, the carryover for 1982-1983 was 1.5 billion bushel. They're estimating, estimating 1.4 billion bushel for this year or about a million bushel short on, on wheat. Now, we are looking at wheat. The wheat that's under loan, and we'll talk about it in specifically in the, in the wheat areas, like we were talking this morning, the wheat that's under loan is, is under a price block already. But there's a, lot, there's a lot of people who didn't comply. There's a lot of wheat that is not under loan, and that's the one we want to work on to get, to get this thing going, uh, get, get everything, get the wheat thing started to sign up so it'll, so it'll coordinate with what's going on in corn and soybean. Uh, the drought situation and what we're looking at, if the situation that the drought put a lot of people in, in the Corn Belt, in the southern Corn Belt, all the way across, uh, running way up into areas in Minnesota. Uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, I traveled around over the Corn Belt extensively this summer. Uh, parts of Iowa look pretty good, but the best crops that I saw was anywhere was in the state of Wisconsin and Michigan as far as overall crops and everything was concerned. So I think what we need to do, and not to go into a whole lot of time because it's, we were already late starting here, is I want to turn it over to 
Mark Rolfing, who is Director of Operations. Let him talk to you a few minutes. Shelley's going to talk to you about bargaining, the strategy and the bargaining strategy behind this thing. And then Dave's going to talk to you about the settlements and the importance of that aspect of it. And we'll break down into the regional meetings this morning. So with that, I'm not going any further, and that's not very much time, but basically the whole idea behind what we're doing is just keep one thing in the back of your mind. We have got to move the market. It's got to be done. We've got to do it by two things. Number one is signing that up and making that commitment on a contract that we are going to do something to move that price. And the other thing is it's the psychological effect that it's going to have out in the country when producers start talking about it. That psychological thing is, has got much to do with what we're trying to do for the people in this room than anything. If we, the alternative is, if we don't do anything, if we don't do anything, and you've already got the psychology out here from the, from the independent sources and the government, that we're going to look at an 8.4 to 9 billion bushel corn crop, if we sit here and don't do anything this winter, and that should happen, or anything close to that should happen, with no government programs, you're going to see fence row to fence row crops for next year. You've already got a lot of wheat stuck in the ground. And the wheat that I've seen around the country looks very, very good. There might be pockets where it doesn't. If we don't do anything, folks, by next fall, you're going to be looking at one heck of a mess. You're going to be looking at a disaster. And I don't believe, and from the people I've talked to, that very many more of us can stand another disaster after the drought and after everything else and the interest rates and everything been, been where it's at. We've got to step out. We've got to take the risk, if that's what you want to call it. But we have got to step out there and lead this thing and get these other farm organizations and these other members of these other commodity groups involved in this. We don't have to feed them the whole bale of hay at one time. Get them to understand that together we can raise the market. And that's the most important thing that we've got to do. If we don't do anything, everybody in here knows what the alternatives are. We don't even have to waste your time or my time talking about it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Rofing. And then we'll, when we break up in the regions, we've got, there's three rooms back here behind you with chairs. Go back in. Mark will tell you where, who's going to be in charge of what rooms. Just go back in there and sit down and, and start talking about and signing your grain up and deciding how you're going to work it in your areas. We'll coordinate the thing through the home office, but it's going to be up to each individual area to keep the thing rolling out there with information coming from the home office and tying the whole thing together. So, Mark. Thank you, Roger. I'm certainly glad to see it at this early hour the amount of people we have and the interest we have involved in the grain department. And I hope that by the time you leave here, you understand uh, how we work a little better, why we do what we do, and how we can better serve you and how you can better serve yourself. That's our only goal. My responsibility is operations, meaning basically uh, if you don't get your check on time, uh, eventually that will probably get on my desk. And if your grain isn't blocked properly, that's my fault too. And I hope that you can honestly say over the past year that conditions have improved. We are now almost totally computerized and we all take our little time out from time to time to cuss the computer. But it does for us what we have to admit we couldn't do without it. I think our system does not run flawlessly, but it runs very close to that. We have proceeded over the last three to five years on a program called Program Marketing. It was a major thrust of this department. It still continues to be the common sense approach to how we handle your grain. Basically put, we try to advise you on a day-to-day -day basis by selling your grain when given to us at bargainer's discretion at the top third of the market. We basically watch the market fluctuations day-to-day -day and make the very best sales we can make. 
We have a performance record on that program that I'll rival with anyone in the business that's trying to do that. There are others that are trying to do that. We just do a tremendous job of it. Now, what, why do we then talk about price blocks? A 450 corn block, a $10 bean block. Because even if you hit all the highs, even if you hit all the highs of a $2 corn market and a $5 bean market, you can't stay in business. Our numbers as members, as grain producers, dwindle each year as evidenced by nearly every convention. Now, maybe the production doesn't, but the numbers of you setting out there have. That has to be stopped. Basically, the faces in this crowd are not all that different from the faces in this crowd four years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago. Most of you are here because basically you believe in collective bargaining. You're here this convention because you have confidence in that NFO is improving its methods of reaching its goal through collective bargaining. And most of you believe that you have to put pressure on a market by holding production in various ways from the market. What you're going to hear here today might be mistook for a holding action. And we, over the last five years in this organization, have learned to shudder at that term because everyone told us it was a bad term. Maybe it is. Let me tell you basically what's different about establishing a block and a holding action. In a holding action, we were demonstrating our dislike of the prices by holding commodities off the market. And it was effective. But what happened? As the price levels raised, we didn't have a contractual arrangement with those participants to make sure that we held to a reasonable level. And so we had slippage. We had sellout. And it's common in anything you do. Because people begin to wonder, you know how that old thought process goes, I'm not going to sell out, but that guy down the road is, so I'm going to get ahead of him. So you have to be contractual. You have to, you have to contract. That's why we are going to ask you folks first in this room, as delegates of this convention and guests and NFO members in general, almost without question, we're going to ask you to sign your grain on these blocks where they apply. We're also going to ask you to go out and get your neighbors to sign on this contract too. We're going to ask you to put two cents a bushel up front good faith money, if you will, to prove to us, to prove to you, and to prove to your neighbor that you're going to stick on that block. Now, should a catastrophe come about, sure, we're going to let you out. But the fact is, we are now contractual. That is the difference. This block will work. 512 million bushels of corn. For years and years and years, it's been pretty common knowledge in the trade that 600 million bushels or less represented a complete scarcity of corn. In other words, the corn was used up at that point. That includes a lot of things. Uh, one of the things is, is that bottom foot or so in a lot of bins isn't much quality to the corn left or the grain. It's also an air factor built into those figures. If you go back here about five years, when the marketing year was changed one month, and one month's production was added, just as an accounting situation that really wasn't there. We are extremely short of corn. I've, I've went into a little bit on this bargaining. At this time, I'm not going to steal Shelley's thunder. Most of you know Shelley Robertson. He is in charge of nationwide bargaining. As we are decentralized, 
We have bargainers in each unit that try to keep abreast of local developments in the market and therefore do a better job of bargaining for you. Shelley coordinates these bargainers, keeps them up to date, constantly trains both the existing bargainers and new ones, and more importantly, he works on the bargaining of national blocks, such as this block. So at this time, most of you know Shelley. I'd like to introduce Shelley Robertson. Thank you, Mark. As I look over the crowd, I see that I know a lot of you, but I also see a few that look like new faces, which I'm glad to uh, have the privilege of seeing. I thought to uh, give you a little background to uh, develop a better understanding it. I'd like to go back into my background just a little bit for a moment so that you understand why I'm in the position I am and uh, uh, why I may or may not be qualified for what I'm doing. I uh, have a farm in uh, Pendleton, Oregon. We raise soft white wheat and barley out there. And I came to Corning some 11 years ago as the director of the grain department and was director for a little over two years went into specialties and was there for a long time, then I retired until my family decided they couldn't stand me any longer around the house. And that's the truth. They had a vote one night at the supper table, and I got the message. <laughs> so I came back to work, and I first went into dairy and the sales training end of it. And then uh, a little bit better than a year ago in September, I was transferred into grain to um, uh, give assistance there. So I've had a long history of working with grain and other specialty crops, and especially in the bargaining. And this is one of the reasons why uh, apparently I was chosen to fill that slot. But for those that may not know who I am, uh, that'll give you a little bit better understanding of the situation. And I thought that it would be uh, important that you understand that. Next, you need to understand uh, my function and, and what I'm to do uh, so that you see how it fits into the overall a game plan, and there is a game plan. With the decentralization, you'll have in each of the areas, and some of you already have it, your bargainers right there in that office, whether it be in Salina, Kansas, or in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, or out in Montana, uh, wherever it may be, in Minster, Ohio, whatever, you'll have your local bargainers. And we learned something in the past and, uh, that we uh, dealt with. When we first started out, and let me take you back a little bit in history, when we first started out uh, moving grain in the early days, you know, the good old days is the way we always talked about it. I don't know what was so good about them, but that's what we always say in the good old days. We had trouble uh, getting anyone to even negotiate with us, to write a contract with us. So when we first started out in grain, the local counties would do their own bargaining, anything to get an NFO name on a contract. And for those of you that remember that, that will bring back memories. And for those of you that are a little younger and have not experienced that, you begin to see how the development came. As we started moving volume and showed that we could be contractual, that we could deliver, we were able to start moving larger volumes to better buyers each time. We first started out with the local elevators, then we got into uh, local brokers, and then pretty soon we started making it into a few of the terminal markets, and it started to continue. The, mo the moment that we got into the terminal markets, we started developing problems because we would have a marketing area uh, bargainer uh, selling grain into, let's say, Portland or Minneapolis, doesn't matter where, or into California. And there would be another bargainer talking to that same buyer. And all of a sudden, he discovered that he could get barley at one price from one and at another price from the other uh, bargainer. And it created problems. And I think it would be obvious. I'm, it's just like uh, you know, the son coming to you and saying, hey, Dad, can I borrow the car? And you say, I don't know, uh, whatever your mother thinks. And he goes to Mom, and he says, hey, Dad says it's OK if I use the car. You know, it's that kind of a situation got into. So we discovered at that point that we had to regionalize. And for you people that uh, remember that, that's what we did. And we put the bargaining into regions then, and it really started helping. And as we continued, we discovered that we had to go national in scope. So that's where we are today. That at any time that we're bargaining, we need to keep the national 
idea in mind because even though it may be a local sale or moving within a local confined region, those prices are still compared throughout the rest of the country by that company because the companies we deal with today are not only national but international. And therefore, one of the functions that uh, I perform is to see to it that we do coordinate that, that we don't have uh, the bargainer in Kansas selling hard red wheat for a better bargain price than what we're selling it out of Fargo. You know, that would defeat our purpose, wouldn't it? So that's one of my functions. And the way we perform that is uh, through telephone, uh, through our um, uh, computer uh, lash-up. We actually communicate uh, through the computer, believe it or not, and uh, uh, through visits and upgrading that way. Uh, we're in constant contact. In addition to that, uh, each of the offices has their own gin machine, and all that is is a marketing service reporting service that tells us uh, what the uh, uh, local news is, the weather, uh, international events, and all of that. In addition to that, we have what we call a quote board, and that follows the Chicago uh, Board of Trade and the Minneapolis Board of Trade, the Kansas City uh, Board of Trade, and the rest of them on a momentary basis so that at any time you uh, can see what is happening on the floor there at that trading post. Because uh, whether we like it or not, those trades do influence what we're able to do, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. We have cussed the futures uh, year in and year out for a long time, and I'm not going to get into the merits of that today, but we do need to know what is happening there so as bargainers handling the production that uh, we're in the know. So that's all coordinated uh, through the home office, through various mechanical and electrical means and uh, through personnel. During this decentralization process, and it will continue for some time because we're not totally decentralized, it is very important that we work extremely close together. In some areas, you may not have a bargainer yet. As an example, uh, uh, perhaps David City in Nebraska. Uh, Ed out there, uh, Ed Tiverti, does do some of the bargaining, but we do some of it also in the home office. So it takes very close coordination to make sure that it's done properly. As we train the bargainers for those areas, and you have them, then obviously we need the other types of coordination and upgrading. The bargainers we have in most of the areas, well, actually we have about 50-50. We have uh, about as many bargainers out of the trade that have been trained professionally as we do those that we train ourselves. And quite frankly, uh, depending on the nature of the individual, uh, you can end up with a good product either way. Although I uh, do give preference to our own members that uh, uh, want to become staff and want to learn and be trained, and uh, they become excellent bargainers when we do that. And one of the reasons is, of course, they have a vested interest in what they do because most of the time they still have a farm themselves or a ranch, whichever the case may be. So that is my function, and this is what we do. Now, the amazing thing and what's amazed me about the National Farmers Organization for years in bargaining is the fact that any time we come out with something, someone else starts copying it. It's not the other way around. I can give you an example of that. About five or six years ago, we were having our uh, young farmers meetings in Corning, Iowa, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with those. And we were explaining to them how that it was so necessary to forward contract at that time, how it was necessary to have a bargainer handle it for you. Well, bingo. In the next six to nine months after that, you started seeing in the uh, livestock journals and the uh, trade journals how, and in the farm journal itself, other magazines and publications, how the producers were being told that they should do that. One of the things that was being told back in those days and one of the things we were doing was going direct. And a lot of interest was created at that time going direct overseas. We started it. And you'll discover that every time that we go along on a program that we seem to be out in the forefront, which is good. Because as long as they're copying us, they'll never catch up with us. And it also tells us that we must be doing something right or they wouldn't copy us. Uh,